Thank you. Our next witness. Hi, my name is Irene Burgess. Um, I am a parent of um, students that attend California Connections Academy. Um, my boys are extremely highly gifted children. Um, they also suffer with severe issues of anxiety, sensory disorder, Asperger's food allergies, and insomnia. And going to a traditional brick and mortar school has always been hard for my children. I have always looked for an alternative type of schooling for them, but nothing was available in the Northern California County that we lived. This was a rural area and was harder to find options for our family. In the summer of 2011, my husband received a promotion for his job, which meant a, ma a major move for my family to Stockton, California. Placing my children in the local schools led to relentless bullying. This amount of stress caused severe stomach aches and missed many days of school. Although there was sufficient medical documentation provided, we were still being faced with truancy charges, yet my child could not handle being bullied. The thought of going to the school terrified him. He would break down in these horrific panic attacks. <laughs> Excuse me, I apologize. That would last four hours, to sometimes two days, even more. <coughs> I started looking for more schools, and one showed me the quality of schooling that my children deserved. But unfortunately, we lived outside of the Boundary County lines, but was offered to other children in the state. I was devastated because I thought my prayers had been answered. As my children still had to suffer in their current situation, I, and they became more depressed and more scared to attend the schools they were at. California Connections Academy had opened a new school in Ripon Unified School District, and I was within their boundary lines, and I immediately enrolled my children, and it turns out it was a perfect fit. So now our current problem is that we will be moving again for another promotion into Northern California, where my my husband's ailing parents live. If this legislation is to pass, we will not have to choose between a job promotion and taking care of our ailing parents or giving our children an amazing education that fits their needs. We shouldn't have to choose. Why should our children suffer because my, my husband is being successful in his job? Why should our children have to change their education structure just because we live in another county where online education makes it all possible? Not every child fits in the box. Not every child is comfortable in a traditional brick and mortar. Children have a constitutional right to a free education. Why can't they be given the right to learn in the way that best suits them? I know that my children are ready to face what faces them in the future because of the, imagine, the amazing education they are receiving. They are given the time to complete their thoughts when they're doing a project. Isn't that what we do in the real world? We are given a project and we are expected to finish it. My son asked what he liked so much about online schooling. The fact that he can get enough sleep to function properly due to insomnia issues and allergies. He can start on a science project, finish it three or four hours later with the exact same thought process he had when he started it. He doesn't have to worry about getting to a classroom and only having a few, five, a few minutes, five days in a row to complete it, work on the project. My children deserve to keep their education structure with a quality school like California Connections Academy and online education. We could, we could do that if only the policy would allow us. Thank you for your opportunity to share my family's story today and your recognition that all kids learn differently. Thank you. Uh, sir, if you want to state your name, affiliation, and position. Sure. Ron Shea Jones on behalf of K-12, Kava, and all of our teachers, not just some of our teachers, in strong support. Just one sentence. The committee analysis talks about the report in the public interest. We were not allowed to have any voice in that report. They didn't ask us for any information, so I don't know how, not the committee analysis, but I don't know how they came up with the report or where their information came from. Thank you. I think it's well documented there. Uh, do we have any witnesses in opposition? If they could come forward. Yeah. 
Mr. Chair and members, Seth Bramble, on behalf of the California Teachers Association, also a parent, really appreciate the passion expressed today. We don't have a position on this piece of legislation. The uh, educators at California Virtual Academy did come to us uh, to help them in their unionization process. And a lot of the stories that we heard, stories about uh, money that should be flowing to California classrooms, money that should be flowing to the students we have here instead going to advertising, instead going to a for-profit uh, company in Virginia, caused us some pause about this kind of a policy. But I think uh, the best spokespeople to talk about the world of virtual education in some cases is the educators working there in the front lines. So I just want to allow them uh, an opportunity to share their stories. Well, do, you, do you have a witness, sir? If you have a witness that wants to come forward. It The others will be allowed to state their their position. Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Sarah Vigras. I'm a K through fifth grade teacher at California Virtual Academies, and I live in Riverside. I'm here to express concerns about AB 207. As a teacher for the largest virtual charter school in the state, I'm concerned about expanding the number of students served by the virtual charter schools prior to having more oversight in place. Our school receives the same amount of ADA from the state as a traditional public school. However, roughly 50% of that money goes to our management company, K-12 Inc., a for-profit company in Virginia. The result of so many resources being diverted out of the state is that students are receiving inadequate materials to support their learning. In February 2014, a panel of CAVA parents met with the K-12 Board of Directors to discuss their experiences in our school. One of our parents made the request for a hard copy of a science textbook. The board asked if she would be willing to pay for it. Her tax dollars already fund our school. To ask her to pay out of pocket for a textbook for her child flies in the face of a free public education. I feel that it is vital we have more legislation in place requiring virtual charter schools to be transparent and accountable in their finances before they are permitted to expand the number of students they serve. Thank you. Thank you. One more witness in opposition. Hello, uh, my name is Debbie Skoltak. I'm a high school math teacher with California Virtual Academies. I've taught there about five years, and I currently live in Oceanside, California. Um, I'm also opposed to this bill. Um, our main concern is our inability to teach. Um, we, um, uh, am, I also taught in traditional schools before I came to Kava. When I taught in a traditional school, I spent 30 to 35 hours preparing and delivering my lessons. At Kava, I spend five to seven hours a week. We feel that this is cheating our students. Our students are not getting the educations they deserve. What we do instead is we do a wide variety of very time-consuming clerical duties because our administration does not hire the clerical staff that is needed. Um, we feel that the dollars are better spent on our students in our classrooms than leaving the state to corporate interests. We urge you to um, look at this bill and um, and, and um, it, it's just not the time for it. Thank you. Uh, why don't we go to the public? Uh, any members of the public in support of this bill? Seeing, number, seeing none, uh, any members of the public in opposition, please state your name, affiliation, and position. My name is Rebecca Flynn, and I teach for California Virtual Academy, K through five. I currently have 29 elementary students that I service. I urge you to oppose AB 207 um, because this has a drastic effect on our students if we increase the range. Thank you. I'm, I am Mark Holtzbeck. I'm a special education teacher with California Virtual, education, of California Virtual Academies in San Joaquin. I teach students in Alameda County and Contra Costa County. I urge you to oppose it because I see things that are affecting special education students as well. Thank you. My name is Jen Shilin. I am a high school teacher at California Virtual Academies. The existing framework for charter oversight is not working. AB 207 erodes local control for our state. We caution against expansion of enrollment boundaries without also strengthening measures for accountability and transparency. We're glad to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman and members. Tristan Brown with the California School Employees Association in opposition today. We believe this is ripe for uh, accountability and oversight regulation and not expansion at this time. Thank you. Thank you. 
Laura Fair with Public Council Law Center. We also sent in a letter, but we've represented two students recently who were enrolled in these schools and with disastrous results, um, one of them with special education needs. We have great concerns about the lack of accountability, and we hope you'll vote against it. Jason Spadaro, second year English teacher, California Virtual Academies from Thousand Oaks, California. I come here today to oppose this bill. I feel it is the wrong bill at the wrong time. Before we just go expanding virtual education, we need to think about how effective it is for the students. I have not heard one analysis or anything from the supporters about is this model of education working. Uh, I could tell you that our graduation rates are below average. Our API scores have been below average, and we need to think about student achievement first and try to figure out how to get that up before we just go expanding this without even thinking about it. Thank you. Thank you. Any members of the committee wish to comment? Mr. Chair, I'd like to say a few words. Um, I first want to thank the author for bringing this bill forward, and I do want to thank the uh, witness, uh, the parent who really spoke uh, with your um, personal experience. Uh, I do agree with you that uh, all kids learn differently and they do have different needs. And in today's 21st century technology and the way that we provide education, I believe virtual um, online charter school is one of the ways that we can really provide quality education to students that are different. And so in that uh, thinking process, I do not believe the money should be a barrier, uh, and parents should have choice on where and how their children should be educated. And so the, one of the uh, witnesses who was speaking in opposition to this bill talked about the, uh, whether or not this model is uh, working, and I think our witnesses who spoke in support of that have clearly stated that it is working, and API uh, scores are increasing, and again, it provides a different type of learning environment, and the school, uh, the teachers do have that uh, choice to do just that. So I would be very happy to support this, and uh, I would like to move the bill for voting. Thank you. Mr. Travis? I have a, a question, a, a concern really, and maybe the gentleman who runs one. Um, everybody here wants to ensure that children learn. And the statements made um, is that if we allow online charges to expand, or virtual online to expand, that the quality of education would drop dramatically. Could you give any numbers or specifics to to support that or not support that? Uh, I don't believe I'd said that uh, the quality of education would drop dramatically. No, your opponents did, though. Oh. I'm trying to, I want to hear the other side of the argument. Well, for me, uh, what what's going on right now, to be very frank, um, the opposition has all been from one school. And if that one school has issues internally and can't serve their students, then that's a separate issue. Uh, what we're asking is that you allow virtual schools to service students, all students that want to be serviced by virtual schools, not being prohibited by a county line. Mr. Chavez, we already have 15,000 students that we service in the state of California. Oh, hold on, hold on. This isn't a give and take here. So. I, I just Mr. Chavez, is your discussion with the gentleman, the witness? Yes, that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. The, um, so my concern is just the quality of education. So how many students do you serve and what's your API? Our stu we service almost 4,000 students. We're just below 4,000 students statewide. Uh, one of our schools, Capistrano Connections Academy, has an API of 791. Now that was for the 12-13 school year. The state of California hasn't given I APIs for the last two years. And our school in Ripon, California Connections Academy at Ripon, currently serving, we'll see, Capital School currently serves 2,700 students. The Ripon School currently services 800 students. And the API for, Cap or for Ripon was 809. So the... Are you a member of uh, CCSA, California Charter School Association? Yes, we are. Sorry. You're a member of them? Yes. Uh, has Ed Voice looked at your program and seen what you've been doing? I believe they have. We just finished our uh, accreditation through WASC. Is Ed Voice 
today, actually. You got accredited to WASC? Yes. You know, Mike, last year one of the biggest issues in higher ed because of the shortage amount of seats in colleges was virtual online education. And in fact, the governor came out and challenged the, the uh, regents to look at online education as a solution. And, um, and we know that there's actually uh, in higher ed programs that are online that are doing very good by uh, especially uh, military families who are deployed and because they're moving all the time. It's, we have it's common to have uh, online virtual education. My uh, the only other comment I'll make is this, is, and I've told the CCSAs this and I've told charter schools this, they need to police out their own bad actors because I know, because I've seen it, uh, there are charter schools that are taking advantage of families and making money and uh, not doing a good job. And uh, just like I guess I could argue, we have the Vagar incident in LA where there's public schools that aren't doing so good either. <clears throat> so um, everybody who's involved in this needs to find the bad actors, whatever the environment they're at and methodology they're teaching, and purge them because they're hurting children. And that's just unacceptable. And, uh, but I don't, but I think that's a different component on what we're talking about on the delivery system of online education. The only other thought I have on it is that parents choose to put their children in these situations. It's actually a choice where if they were living in certain places, they wouldn't have that sort of choice. Uh, I use the example of the military because they're always traveling. The, uh, so parents make a choice to do this sort of program. Uh, for that reason, I'll be supporting this because I think we need to understand even the governor was supporting online education for higher ed. Um, so we need to not throw this technology away, but I would caution you, sir, is that your organization, you ought to police your people. Because I, I met with this other group, and some of the numbers they're talking about where they're abusing children, and it is abuse when you're not giving them a good education. Those those industries need, and charters and business people need to be taken down. And that's what the WASC accreditation is about, and that's what we're trying to do. Thank you. May I have the opportunity to respond, Mr. Chair? Is that okay? Uh, I'm sorry? May I have the opportunity to respond? Uh, yes, I just want to note here, I'm looking at the support and opposition. I don't see that the Charter School Association is supporting this. Just for information, go ahead. So um, it appears to me that there is a bad actor inside the charter, Virtual Charter School Association, uh, namely the Virtual Charter Academy. Is that the name of the organization? That is not. What is it? Kava. Kava. California Association? California Virtual Academy. Virtual Academy. So if there's one bad actor, um, I, I would hate to think that the legislature would not uh, prohibit parents and freedom of choice and having these things. If there is a bad actor, then we need to go after the bad actor, but not limit the opportunities for parents like the witness that testified today or the one that testified last year in a domestic violence and abusive situation that was able to move her family to a contiguous county and still continue their children's ed education. Um, on the earlier bill that was heard, one of my colleagues who's not in the room right now said that there are uh, students students out there with severe uh, anxiety and emotional behavioral needs that are struggling to be serviced in our public school systems. Uh, the Virtual Academy here, California Connections Academy, is, is one of those solutions. Is it the answer to every student? No. Is it the answer to probably 15 additional families that these students would fail if they were forced back into the public school system? If Ms. Burgess's students, her children, were forced back into the public school system, there's almost 100% guarantee by the parent and by what she's experienced that her students would fail. This is not the answer for every single student in our public school system, but it is the answer for her students. And that just allows her to be able to put her students in, these, in this academy that works. If we have a bad actor in the virtual charter school industry, then those bad actors need to be policed and gone after. But this mm -hmm to limit the ability of people who are performing very well and stop the five families that couldn't continue their education or the 15 students that couldn't continue or Mrs. Burgess's two children that weren't able to continue their education. That's almost, um, 
it's it's just a it's just a strange way to look at things. And so I would just ask that um, you know, like I said, it's not an absolute for all students, but it does help. 15 or 10 or 20 and if it helps these and why do we let these fall through the cracks if this bill is an answer to that right move thank you miss grove move the bill okay and huh? thank you i, I think I the concern that some have here today isn't as necessarily virtual charter schools it's the lack of oversight or the lack of an oversight or an oversight structure so, and so why today would we expand that ability when there really is no oversight structure. So I think we, that's the question so that remains. The reason in, why you, on, on, oh, sorry. So that's the question that remi remains in my head. I don't need an answer today. I, I, I don't know that you can give me an answer because I don't think there is an answer. But just so, so you understand, sir, uh, with mm -hmm. all due respect, is that I have a virtual charter school here representing the fact that they have above state average API scores. They have above state Thank average you. English, learning, English learner scores. Do we have scores. any further comments from the committee? You, you may close. No, that's okay. Thank you. You may close. I just respectfully ask for your I vote and ask you to take into consideration these few students that are drastically affected by um, the contiguous county rule and that you give these few students an opportunity to be able to t attend the school that works for them and their families. Thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, if you call the roll. The motion is due pass to appropriations. O'Donnell? No. O'Donnell, no. Chavez? Yes. Chavez, aye. Kim? Yes. Kim, I. McCarty? Santiago? No. Santiago, no. Thurmond? Weber? Hey, the bill is on call. Thank you, sir. I got another meeting. Where are we now? Okay. Uh, Mr. Jones Sawyer, file item number 11, AB 224. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Move the uh, bill. Let me start by quickly um, stating that I accept the committee's proposed amendments and as author amendments and appreciate the consultant on for her work on the issue. AB 224 requires the State Department of Education in consultation with the California Foster Youth Education Task Force to develop a standardized notice of education rights for foster children and to post the notice on its web internet website. Over the last de decade, California has been a leader in enacting legislation to protect the education rights of foster youth, including ensuring their rights to remain, to remain in their school origin, obtain a speedy transfer of records and cr partial credits, receive extra support if they face disciplinary action, and have equal access to education services in the least restrictive environment and modified graduation re requirements. Unfortunately, far too many foster youth and their foster parents are unaware of these protections. As such, these youth lack the tools to effectively advocate for their education need rights in order to circumvent barriers to their educational success. Pursuant to both SB 177 in 2013 and the federal McKinney-Vento Homelessness Act, hom homeless youth in California have the right to receive notice in several forms about their unique education rights, which are similar to those of foster youth. Here today to testify in support is Laura Farr of Public Counsel and Kyle uh, Sporletter, Spore Leader from California Youth Connection. I respectfully ask for your I vote. Uh, the, did you have a witnesses that wishes to speak on this item? Go ahead. First witness, please. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Kyle Sporleader. I'm with the California Youth Connection. We are an organization, a youth-led advocacy organization of current and former foster youth. Our members a, uh, range in age from 14 to 24. And uh, with that age range, we have members that are in various levels of their uh, educational experience. Uh, I just want to highlight for you from our experience working with our members as foster youth that unfortunately when we look in the education arena, foster youth as a population are a population that experience outcomes that are far behind their counterparts in the general population and actually educational outcomes that are far behind their counterparts in any other disadvantaged group or population of students. And so it is, it's vital that we support our foster youth and luckily as uh, Mr. Jones Sawyer um, Luckily, as Mr. Jones Sawyer uh, specified, this last decade we have done a lot in this body to make sure that there's legislation that has been passed to support these youth. And 
I think that the key theme that we've seen for foster youth is that unfortunately we do these things, we pass legislation to help them in different arenas of their life, but they don't know about their rights. And so this would simply be an opportunity to, to educate our members and educate other foster youth about what they have available to them so they can succeed. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. The next witness, please. Laura Fair with Public Council Law Center. Very briefly, um, this bill is inspired by all the young people who we represent who unfortunately come to us often in high school after they've been through, for example, 10, 15, 16 schools um, who can oftentimes not even remember the names of the people whose homes they've lived in. And so many times they are the ones who are doing the advocacy, right? And so one young woman who came to me inspired this bill. Um, she said, if I had known that I had the right to school of origin, if I knew that I could have asked to get my partial credits, I would have asked for it. I would have asked for it in court, I would have asked for in school, I could have been a better advocate. Also, we have many folks in the education community who, when they learn about these things, want to help foster youth. And so we want to make certain that these, these inf this information is spread as widely as possible because we think we can, with all the great protections in place, change these outcomes. We just need your help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any mem members of the public in support, please state your name, affiliation, and position on the bill. Danielle Molay, California Alliance of Child and Family Services in support. Deborah Escovedo, Staff Counsel with Youth Law Center, a, a co-sponsor and strong supporter of the bill. Shereen Walter, California State PTA, in support of the bill. Lexi Howard, on behalf of the Juvenile Court Judges of California, a section of the California Judges Association, we are late support. Molly Dunn with the Alliance for Children's Rights, in support. Rebecca Gonzalez, National Association of Social Workers, California Chapter in Support. Okay. Is there any opposition present? Seeing no opposition, uh, do any members of the committee wish to comment? Uh, we, uh, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Uh, to move and second it, Mr. Jones Sawyer, you may close. I respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, will you please call the roll? The motion is do pass with amendments to appropriations. O'Donnell? Aye. O'Donnell, aye. Chavez? Kim? Aye. Kim? Aye. McCarty? Santiago? Aye. Santiago, aye. Thurman? Weber? The bill is on call. Thank you, committee. 